Welcome to IDF TV. My name is Frank Nymphius and I'm from the Oracle JDeveloper and ADF product management team. In this session, which is the third out of four in which we talk about PL SQL integration in Oracle IDF, we talk about the read access to a store procedure or a ref cursor from ADF business components. Before we start with the topic, let me just emphasize that the best access you can have to the database, of course, is a direct read access to a table or to a view. And the reason here is because table can be indexed. So you can use and leverage the table index. However, if there is a need for you to access data or query data through stored procedures or ref cursor or whatever PLSQL mean you want to use, then that is a valid and fair option to use in ADF business components. If you, however, do so, keep in mind that if you use entities, if you query data through entities, that you will have a cache that allows you, for instance, to perform filtering or sorting without going back to the database, requerying data that they already fetched before. So let's have a look from the architecture perspective how that would look. It's a similar picture to what I showed you on the last recording where we talked about the PSQL API. You see that the view object gets its definition from an XML file, and this XML file then is used to configure at runtime a base class. Now this base class is what you will have to replace with a custom class. And you do this by simply going to your view object in the application navigator. You double click on it or just use the right mouse button. Then in the editor, choose the Java option and create the input class. With the custom input class being opened, you go to the source menu option and just override methods. On this screenshot, you see some of the methods that you need to override. So basically, you override the query uh, for collection, which basically gives you uh, a way to uh, intercept the query request from the view. Then you have a method that will make sure that there is a checking for the has next for collection that would kind of allow you to enable or disable navigation buttons. You have um, create row set from result set or create row from result set, uh, which is basically the most important part here because that will take the data that you fetched from the database and put this into a row that actually then you can display on the screen uh, through a view object. More important than the four or five methods here is what you see in the constructor of this method. There you actually need to set the value of a query to now as well as this where clause. Why do you have to do this? Well, remember that by definition, IDF Business Components is a SQL-based framework, which means that it tries to issue a SQL-based query to the database to fetch data. As you're overriding the whole framework behavior, you want to make sure that there's no traces left of a SQL attempt to query. So in the constructor, you want to reset the query behavior, the native query behavior of the view object, making sure that the IDF Business Components doesn't try to perform a native SQL query against the database tables. So that is what you do in the constructors, and then you do have four or five methods that you need to override. And as we're not going into details in this recording, we just outline the architecture, I recommend you reading the Fusion Developer Guide, and I have a link reference later on on the last slide. And here we explain how to read from a stored procedure, from a ref cursor, and how do you pass arguments back and forth. So we don't need to have all the implementation details in this recording. So here we just focus on the architecture. You see in the header of this slide that we talk about a non-reusable implementation. Now why is this? Well, the same as in the last recording where I talked about PSQL APIs. You see that because you're creating a view impl class for this specific view object, wherever you have a view object that you create or that you need to create a PSQL access, you're recreating all of the code because of this. Yeah? There's a better way to do this, which is a more advanced topic to cover, which we cover on the next slide. Now here, we do have a generic option. And this generic option comes from an article um, that is written by Avram Federman, a former Oracle employee. And still, this is on the blog. And I have a link to the blog on my last slide here. And what Avram is doing here in his article, which he called Maximum Reuse, instead of you writing 
uh, info classes for each of the view object that needs to access a stored procedure or a ref cursor. You just create a generic view object input class. This generic view object input class is then what you would extend from the view object input class that you want to use with your view object. And to make this generic class working, you need to parameterize it. As you know, IDFism components allows you to define custom properties on a view object and on the attributes. So this strategy would allow you to dynamically tell the framework what stored procedure, package name and stored procedure name it should call. And this is how you parameterize it. And just look at the document that Avram wrote. You see there is a second class in this diagram here. And the second class is the dev class, the view object dev class. And this dev class is needed, in your case, to customize. And this is why I said it's advanced, because it's more work to do. Because it needs to read the custom properties in. Our Fusion Developer Guide also has an example for customizing it, or just to accessing custom properties. And we do this by example of kind of um, data mining where a new row will be added in the row set. Just have a look at the documentation. So this is a reusable architecture. If you go with the non-reusable approach, that's fair enough. If you don't have a, no, a lot of view objects that require PL SQL procedures, it's fair enough. If you have a lot of PL SQL to integrate, then think about a generic class. So question for you. Now that you have a view object that reads from a stored procedure, how do you make this updatable? You know, just having a view object is only read-only data. Now how can you make updatable um, lookups to store procedures. Who said entity? All oh, right, you said entity. That's right. Just create an entity. As soon as you have an entity for an ADF business components view object, you basically can update. And if this is a straight table update, or again, if you use uh, the lecture from the previous recording where I talked about PSQL APIs, where you overwrite the DML behavior of ADF business components, you can of course use stored procedures to perform the updates. So there's one lesson left here, which is talking about master detail correlations. Your view object that is based on a stored procedure, you may want to integrate this in a parent-child relationship. And there are two use cases for that. The first use case is where your stored procedure based view object becomes the parent to some SQL based um, child. And you define a view link between your view object and the view object that you created based on a SQL query. Now, the good news here is there's nothing for you to do because that will work out of the box because the SQL-based um, function will understand that it actually needs to get the parent, selected parent value, which is just a matter of looking at the bind variable and query the data accordingly. However, if yours becoming the child and another one is the parent, you will have to do the job for that. And here you can use the um, query for collection, as I put on the slide. And when you create a view link between a parent and a view or a detail view object, then you specify a bind variable. And this bind variable has the name bind underlined attribute name, which if you have, say, a department employee relationship, will be the foreign key, most likely the department ID, um, then being used as a primary key. So that will be bind online primary key. And this gets injected or added as an argument to the execute query for collection. So this is where you get that information. And since in this method, which you overwrite, you call the stored procedure, you can get the variable or the value of this bind variable and make sure that you filter the request to the stored procedure. So everything is possible, even master detail behaviors. It's just all up to you. This slide shows you the promised documentation. There are two documents I want you to read up on. One is Avram's blog. Uh, it's worth reading and also he has the sources out there so that you don't have to start from scratch with your doing because always keep in mind that there is some sort of data transformation between stored procedure, query data, and the data that you use in Java and view, and view objects. So that's all covered in the article and as well in the zip file that you can download from there. And there's a reference to the SQL chapter in the Fusion Developer Guide. And this here might be a different number for the chapter if you're on 12C, because you know our documentation is a growing project. 
and sometimes we just move chapters back and forth. So, but the title wouldn't change. So just have a look at the documentation you have at hand. This concludes this PLC called query uh, recording. Now the next recording, and I mentioned it's four recordings we do about PLC call, will be to give you hints and guidance about how to access PLC call functions and stored procedure from a managed bean, from a method call activity and a route activity. Yeah? So basically calling stored procedures from a client. Now what are the best practices? And the second part of the next recording is also to give you a laundry list of best practices so that you have more or less a list of check marks where you can say, okay, this, this is I need to take into consideration when using PLC within Oracle IDF.